on this edition of Independent Sources, South Bronx Startup, the effort to make the neighborhood the next big thing in the tech sector. I think for us, it's an exciting project mm -hmm. that allows us to give people in the community an opportunity to obtain really good paying careers. And Moving Day, a 10-year plan to provide affordable housing for artists in East Harlem, finally bears fruit. This is a whole community moving for something with an ideal. And the, the, the base of it is creativity. Those stories and more coming up on Independent Sources. Welcome to Independent Sources, bringing you news from New York's ethnic and immigrant communities. I'm Zyphus Lebron. The South Bronx is one of the poorest congressional districts in the United States, and that might make it the last place you would think someone would want to start a tech initiative. But recent advancements are changing that. Startups are now making Port Morris their new headquarters and hiring local residents. Sarah Pizan spoke with Plinio Ayala, president and CEO of Perscolis, an IT job training institute, and Keith Klein, co-CEO of Doran Jones, a software development consulting startup. Plinio, Keith, thank you for being with us today. Thank you. Thank you. So, Plinio, can you tell us about your organization's mission? Sure. So we've been around for 20 years mm -hmm. um, in the South Bronx. That's sort of where our headquarters is located. Mm -hmm. And it was designed to try and prove that you can train people from... Uh, communities like the South Bronx and mm -hmm. have them be successful as IT professionals. So um, the whole mission is to create a, an effective workforce development strategy that can lead to expansion in other communities and mm -hmm. have a huge impact. And so what kind of training are you providing? So it was all intentional around IT. We realized mm -hmm. early on that um, IT mm -hmm. in many ways allowed people to create career pathways in mm -hmm. a relatively short period of time mm -hmm. where they can earn livable wages. And so we've been very successful in getting people placed in jobs after they complete the training. Great. But I think our approach is a little different. We work with employers as sort of our primary customer mm -hmm. to understand what their needs are and we design all of our training programs around those needs. Great, and that's where you come in, right, Keith? That is right. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about where, what is exactly Doran Jones? Sure, so Doran Jones is a technology consulting company that mm -hmm. was founded in 2010 with my business partner, Matt Doran. Mm -hmm. um, and we do, we basically build and test software for a lot of large enterprise IT operations, so banks, financial services company, telcos, media. Mm -hmm. And we got involved uh, with, with Perscolis through my, uh, I was working at Barclays at the time, mm -hmm. and got involved through them with uh, a training program we developed around software testing, and then I ended up leaving uh, Barclays because the program was so successful to join Doran Jones to start up uh, part of the, the testing business and build out the facility in the Bronx. Great. So you are currently relocating from Manhattan to the South Bronx? We are, yes. Tell We're, us why. We are. <laughs> uh, well, one, we think, and, and, I, and I like uh, the Perscolis model around you meet people where they are and mm -hmm. we think that it's really important for us one to be in the Bronx mm -hmm. so we're moving yes from our Manhattan offices and we've actually we're a bit homeless right now that we've moved mm -hmm. uh, we're waiting for the facility to finish we're weeks away mm -hmm. um, but we're actually moving to the Bronx from there because one there's a great sense of community there and a mm -hmm. lot of we're doing with the Urban Development Center is community oriented so mm -hmm. being there every day and working with the folks who live in the neighborhood is super important to us. Mm -hmm. Uh, Plinio, maybe you can tell us more also about this Urban Development um, Center. What's this collaboration about? It's the perfect economic development project. Mm -hmm. It's an opportunity for a not-for-profit like Perscolis to partner with Keith and, and Doran Jones to create jobs in that community. Mm -hmm. And what I think Keith has realized is that we can develop the talent locally mm -hmm. that he can consume and be successful with his company. And so I think for us, it's an exciting project mm -hmm. that allows us to give people in the community an opportunity to obtain really good paying careers. Wow. And I think that uh, yeah. that's a really important point as well is that I've worked all over the planet in IT working for large financial services organizations mm -hmm. and having finally relocated back to, to New York, um, there is a, a really rich source of talent in the Bronx mm -hmm. that we consistently hear back from the students who graduate from mm -hmm. the program would have never been given an opportunity mm -hmm. at jobs like these. And, mm -hmm. and I found that the people that have come through the program and the training that they get are just as good as anybody who I've worked with in India, Eastern Europe, Southeast Asia, any of the places that traditionally get a lot of offshore testing and development work. 
and the 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 great sense of entrepreneurship and mm-hmm. kind of do it yourselfism and all the other great things that come with really talented technology folks are there and it's just been really overlooked for a long time. So, so tell us, because you're going to get some alums, right, from tech. Do you have any number specifics? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So go ahead. Yeah. yeah, so we'll graduate 120 people from our training program, and Keith will hire 120 graduates. Wow. Um, it, it's, it's fantastic when you think about yeah. what that will do to the community, 120 people that are now earning significant Mm -hmm. wages, it's just going to transform that area completely. And what we've committed to is that in the facility itself when it's up and running, Mm -hmm. is that 80% of the people that will be hired into the facility will have come through the Prescolis program. Mm -hmm. So we've set a target for how many folks we think should come through and then however Prescolis needs to get there to bring them through the program is how this partnership works. So what kind of training skill, what kind of skill set are they going to be bringing exactly? Can you be a little bit more specific? We know it's IT, but what exactly are they going to be doing? So there's, there's plenty of can talk about the kind of generic training mm-hmm. program that they get because there's some kind of basic blocking and tackling type of training they get in technology from Perscolis. Mm-hmm. The software testing education program um, is the training uh, uh, curriculum specifically I designed one at Barclays to teach people how to test software. Mm-hmm. So that's a big growth market. It's heavily outsourced. We're carving pieces of that market away to reshore back to the U.S. And so we're teaching people how to test software, break down systems, automate some of the testing that they're doing. Um, and it's a, it's a huge opportunity for them to get a, a ground level entry into a long tech, uh, technology career. Wow, that's fantastic. Right. So Plinio, how do you see this collaboration affecting the community? Well, I think that's, I'm so bullish about it because it really does um, contemplate the way we do business in mm-hmm. the South Bronx. You've got individuals that will be able to establish very good paying careers, and I think the ancillary job growth will be huge. And so you have 100 and, and what will be 150 in total, right, uh, people in this um, urban development center. Mm-hmm. They're going to demand good eateries. They're going to demand um, the laundromat to, to open up across the street. That's going to create additional jobs for that community. So the economic development impact, mm-hmm. I think, potentially could be huge as a result of this project. And, and particularly in the area where we're at, um, we're, we're already seeing interest from other startups wanting to relocate, sublease space. Um, part of the things, uh, some of the activities we're going to do in the first floor of the, of the Urban Development Center are very community-oriented in nature. So we're going to be hosting tech meetups. We're going to be doing hackathons, right. getting people exposure to different aspects. We're negotiating with a company right now to do a product launch mm-hmm. um, in the second quarter in this space. We're partnering with the local high school to give some training to you know the high school or to, to the high school also the, the the middle school. So there's a whole other aspect wow. to this to make the South Bronx really attractive as kind of the next startup alley uh, right. in New York. That was going to be exactly. my next yeah. question: is <laughs> is is the South Bronx the new Silicon Alley? Yeah. It, it could be a tremendous technology corridor for sure, mm-hmm. and it's so close to Manhattan that mm-hmm. it could provide services right into Harlem, the mm-hmm. entire borough of the Bronx. That's very encouraging and very exciting as Doran Jones sort of is the seed to what could be mm-hmm. significant uh, penetration of other technology companies coming to the South Bronx over time. Is, is the city playing any part in this at all? Um, the city and the state have, have both been supportive. Mm-hmm. Um, we've worked through the Empire State Development Fund. They've given us some uh, uh, tax incentives mm-hmm. uh, for the phase two. Uh, phase one is pretty much funded through the Perscolis uh, uh, grants and other ways that they, that they fundraise. Uh, but there's incentives for us for phase two to continue to grow that. That's the additional 300 jobs. Uh, the city's been very supportive through Digital NYC coming mm-hmm. out. They, did a, they just did a meetup out there, um, which some folks have heard about. Uh, so, yeah, they've been very supportive in terms of exposure and getting us access to resources and stuff like that. Great. Well, we wish you guys luck. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us today. It's our pleasure. Thank, Thank you for having us. Still to come on the show, using yoga as therapy for the physically and sexually abused. Before that, Abby Shola and Sarah Pizan have some other news. Thanks, Ifis. Every week we ask you to tell us what's happening in your community. Here are some stories we gathered. Abby, what's trending? Rodents, pools of urine, and fire safety violations. Those are just a few of the dangers found in many of the city's homeless shelters, according to a new report. 
The Department of Investigation surveyed 25 of the city's 156 family shelters and found that many are endangering the lives of thousands of families that depend on them. Wow, so who is responsible for not making sure these conditions were up to par? Well, the DOI is putting the blame on the Department of Homeless Services. Mm -hmm. Basically, they were supposed to inspect these buildings that house these shelters, but they didn't do that. They dropped the ball. So there are so many codes that have been not met. So how many people are being affected by this? Well, there are 50,000 homeless people in the city. Mm -hmm. 25,000 of those are children. So that's who's being affected. And also, the buildings... Um, Two of the shelters are, have been closed by the Department of Homeless mm -hmm. Services, and they're planning to close more. So that's bad for the city's homeless. And then also the ones that haven't met standards, that's bad too. So this is bad all around. Uh, well, there's a hot topic in the Chinese community that's causing major controversies. They're called maternity hotels. They're usually family-run underground businesses that target pregnant tourists from China looking to give birth here and get U.S. citizenship for their unborn child. Wow. So let's break this down. What are maternity hotels? Well, these hotels, if you can even call them that, are basically a one-stop shop for these women to come here and give birth. And it's costly. It costs up to $25,000 for wow. them to come here. And, you know, the, the hotel staff is in charge of taking them to and from, um, you know, hospital and doctor's appointments. They get fed five meals a day. They have oh laundry God. service. It's like the whole ordeal. Wow, that is intense. But coming to the U.S. to give birth is illegal, right? So no, so that's where the whole controversy comes from. It's not legal to come here and give birth, but what is illegal is lying to the authorities about that during the visa application process and when entering the United States. And these hotels help these women with the application process, oh, right? Oh yeah, they, they absolutely help them. They even There's even visa training, applica there's visa applications training uh, prior to them arriving to the United States. Wow. So they even learn how to hide their pregnant bellies before arriving to U.S. Customs. And then once they're here on, on U.S. ground, they basically, uh, the hotel staff helps them, you know, apply for visa application, apply for U.S. passports for their, you know, infants and even social security numbers. Wow, so, yeah. so this is a full-on operation. Absolutely. So we'll keep an eye out on that story. Yeah. Roti is known to be a primary dish in Punjabi households, but when it's served to the community, by the community, it becomes a blessing. How so? Well, it, langar, which means the community kitchen or canteen, is where free meals are made for everyone in the community. Mm -hmm. Basically, people come to the gurdwaras, which is where Sikhs come to worship, and they go to these canteens that are in the gurdwaras, and they are able to get roti, and it's a blessing for them. Oh, what a cool thing. Very cool. So tell me more about the canteens. Yes, the langar has been a central part of Sikh practice for hundreds of years, according to OpenCityMag.com. Mm -hmm. um, at busy, at busy gurdwaras, volunteers come to do serva, which means selfless service. So it's like a sacred practice for them. Um, and they do this around the clock, seven days a week. People come in in droves to come and get free roti. Oh, I'd like to try one. Me too. Maybe we will. Yeah. There's a new festival taking place in New York City, and it's the first of its kind in North America. The Israeli-American Council partnered with the Steinhardt Foundation and the Council for Hebrew Language and Culture to bring you Hagiga Ivrit, a festival that celebrates the Hebrew language. Very cool. What can we expect from that? So the festival features many things from musical performances of Peter and the Wolf, to movie screenings, to interviews with writers, to book signings, to talks with rabbis. It's all around. Nice. And when can we catch this until? The festival is currently taking place and will continue through March 30th. Events are going to happen all across the city, so make sure you log on to their website for more detail. Their website is www.ivritny.org. Thanks for the update, Sarah. We'll definitely check that out. That's it for us this week. Make sure you tweet us at Indie Sources, hashtag Abby and Sarah. And tell us what's buzzing in your community. Thanks for staying tuned. Domestic violence has been called a leading public health threat to women in New York City. It's also one of the leading factors driving up the city's shelter population. It's a scourge, to say the least. Now one group is fighting back. Exhale to Inhale was founded nearly two years ago, and the group's been using yoga to help survivors of domestic violence and sexual assault. Abby Ishola got some insight um, and, and instruction from the program's director, physical. Tara Tonini, and instructor, Julie Fernandez. Tara, tell me a little bit about Exhale to Inhale and how it began. Yeah, um, so Exhale to Inhale is a nonprofit organization based out of New York City. And we um, 
bring free yoga classes to survivors of domestic violence and sexual assault. So we visit um, domestic violence shelters, rape crisis centers, and community centers throughout New York and all of the boroughs. Um, and we've just expanded through Westchester County as well. That's great. Yeah. And Julie, how is yoga something that could help women who've gone through domestic violence? Well, it's definitely something that is helpful. It allows survivors to um, cultivate that relationship with their own bodies that they most of likely have lost um, mm. through their experiences. And how so? Well, when, when in a situation um, of, in fear, we most, most of the time escape our bodies um, to not live that situation. Um, so a lot of times we, we just lose that connection with our bodies. Wow. And Tara, you could probably speak to this because you were in a violent relationship and you use yoga to heal. How did that help you? Yeah, correct. Um, I'm a survivor of domestic violence. Um, why, actually, my DV counselor um, was the one, while I was receiving my services, um, that said, girl, try yoga. <laughs> 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 and uh, with all my nervousness, somehow I conjured up the courage and made it to the mat, and I haven't left. Um, so really, like Julie was saying, taking back your power yeah. and um, feeling your mat and feeling your body and feeling the breath and that's what it's all about for us. Wonderful. I'll yeah. direct this question to both of you. Mm -hmm. um, you know, yoga has become really trendy in the United States and, you know, even some of the positions could be a little intimidating and I think that a lot of people look at it as something that's reserved for the elite. How do you guys make it relatable to the women you work with? Yeah, I definitely um, identify with that for sure. Um, you know, there's yoga studios on every corner virtually in New York City. Um, our classes are a little bit different because we're really bringing the safety and the empowerment back into the physical forms that we do in the yoga practice and also with the breath. So um, our classes are a little bit different than what you would find in a typical studio. Um, we, first of all, bring the safety to the classroom. Um, second of all, all of our language is very invitational. So giving women the choice of what to do with their body at all times through the practice. So really bringing that empowerment back in and the choice. I mean, like, what do I want to do with my body? And yes, I have a decision. That's yeah, right. <laughs> exciting. <laughs> Um, and then we don't do any physical touch. So the teacher stays on her mat throughout the practice. And um, we also don't play any music in the classroom. We've noticed um, that music can be triggering for a lot of students, especially in a traumatic situation. Um, and we also leave the classroom lights on at all times. Wow. So for a traditional yoga class, when you go into like a final resting pose, um, which in Sanskrit is called Shavasana. Yeah. Um, the lights are usually of, off yeah, and you meditate, right? Yeah, so um, we just maintain our practice, um, have sometimes lead short meditations, um, staying very close um, and having a conversation with the students. So letting them know that there's multiple forms of meditation so that while receiving services during the shelter system, they can take their practice with them outside into the world. So why the name Exhale to Inhale? Um, our founder, Zoe LePage, came up with the name. Um, for me, I identify it because I'm a survivor. Um, it was kind of the rock bottom point in my life. Um, and I really had a choice. Like, if I exhale, I can choose to take another breath or just give up. Bye bye, body. And wow. um, for me, it was absolutely I'm going to inhale. And I've never looked back. Wow. So yeah. you're a success story. Are there any other success stories within the program? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we can have a lot of survivors. Um, unfortunately, we don't always keep full contact once the students have left the shelter system. Um, but we do have a lot of return um, students in our community centers. Um, yeah, maybe Julie can speak a little bit more about the women in her programs. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's a, a particular uh, woman who she never did yoga before um, and she came into the classroom and she had a lot of physical limitations so I, I pretty much kept it um, as a meditation class 
and um, she kept coming back for weeks. It's been about three months now that she's wow. there every day um, and has expressed how it has changed her life. Um, her anxiety and depression and all of that has really um, calmed down and, and she's just very, very grateful for the program and I'm happy to be able to bring that to them. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. So we heard all about the program. So now we want to take a look at some of the forms and Julie will be demonstrating. So the first form is called Warrior Two. We start out by grounding the feet, so finding this connection with the physical space in the room. We invite our students there to just notice any sensations that might be occurring in the body and to breathe however it's accessible for them. So generally with trauma, um, the breath doesn't always come from the nose. It typically comes from the mouth. So not constricting um, our students' breath in any way. Just um, inviting them to breathe however it feels best for them in their body. Um, a lot of the women really like this posture because it feels very much like a warrior goddess of yes. sorts. I'm looking at it and I feel like I want to do the warrior pose. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> we need a warrior uh, cry of some sort right now. Absolutely. And the next pose? Yeah, the next uh, form is peaceful warrior. Form. Yeah, form. Um, peaceful warrior is a little bit um, of a balance so the feet still remain grounded and we invite our students if they're interested to explore a little bit deeper in the body with an extension through the side. Um, they can do anything they'd like with the head depending on how their neck and their jaw is feeling that day um, and we always um, invite them to explore you know like what does this feel and if it doesn't feel right you don't have to do it. Hmm. Yeah. And the next form? The next form is tree. Um, which is one of my personal favorites. Do you like tree, Julie? I absolutely do. Yeah. So um, tree works a lot with the balancing in the body. So an invitation for Julie whenever she's ready to make a connection again with the floor. She might feel the empowerment through the feet. She might even feel strength in the legs. So do they just hold this for as long as possible? Mm-hmm, yeah. We generally guide with a count, so a really fun way that people don't feel stuck in a posture and they can count down. And then there's always a friendly reminder to our students that they're always in full control of their body at all times. So if the posture feels really good, they can stay a little longer. If it doesn't serve them at the moment, they can back out of it. Um, and we also send them friendly reminders of the body might be different every day. So sometimes tree pose might mm -hmm. feel good for me, and then on Thursday it doesn't. Don't want to do mm -hmm. it. <laughs> and yeah. there's no right or wrong answer to yoga. Well, it definitely Absolutely. looks very empowering. Yeah. Thank you so much, ladies. Thank you. Tara and Julie. Thank you. Thanks for Thank demonstrating. You. Absolutely. To learn more about the program, you can visit the website exhaletoinhale.org. When we come back, moving in day in East Harlem. Finally from us, Mayor Bill de Blasio recently reiterated his commitment to creating affordable housing for artists during his State of the City address. This week, we'll take a look at the latest step towards reaching his goal of 10,000 units of low-cost housing for artists over the next 10 years. Judith Escalona filed this report on El Barrio's Artspace PS 109, the converted public school building just opened its doors to qualifying low-income artists. Tenants began moving into El Barrio's art space PS109 early this year. The newly renovated building has been converted into 89 apartment units for artists. Whether you're a painter, writer, or musician, there's a space for you if you meet the city's criteria for low-income housing. Maria Rivera is a singer and dancer with a hip-hop and R&B group called Unstoppable Dance Crew. They just called me in, hopefully I can get the place. I found out that it's actually most of the people is actually artists in here, so maybe we can all link up, do something, talent show, you know, something great for the community. The community is East Harlem, better known as Spanish Harlem or El Barrio, 
a neighborhood with a rich Puerto Rican cultural tradition that has drawn other Latinos to the area. Today, gentrification is displacing longtime residents and artists. El Barrio's art space PS109 is trying to stave off their departure and save the community's unique character. The construction and the pre-development took many years and you know now that the building is completed, you know, we're entering a new phase where we're breathing life into the building by uh, occupying it with uh, artists. Gustavo Rosado is the executive director of El Barrio's Operation Fightback that manages and builds low-income housing in Spanish Harlem. They partnered with Artspace, the Minnesota-based organization that has been developing housing for artists nationwide since 1979. The Artspace team came to New York, um, toured buildings in all five boroughs, looking for um, a, a building that would lend itself well to becoming artists' live workspace, and eventually found uh, PS109. So since 2004, we have been working with Fight Back, with the city, to save this building and renovate it and make it a home for artists. El Barrio's art space PS109 costs $52 million for a gut renovation of the interior and restoration of the facade in keeping with the city's landmark requirements. City guidelines also called for low-income residents to have a recreational space. The developers substituted an art gallery in its place. Painter and multimedia artist Antonia Guerrero, who recently moved in, says it's a dream come true. I think that the design of the spaces is uh, wonderful. It's beautifully uh, put together. They have that wonderful gallery space downstairs, which I'm sure will be put to many, many different uses. People are going to come up with all kinds of interesting programs, I think, that will want to involve people of the members of the community. But that hope won't be shared by all the artists who applied. Over 5,000 applicants, including longtime residents of Spanish Harlem, were eliminated by lottery or proved ineligible. We certainly did advocate for the community artists where we could and tried to see if we could push the limits somewhat. Um, and would they be any types of waivers or special consideration for community residents? But unfortunately, we were not successful. Despite that, the developers and tenants like Carlos and Alenka David expect great things. I am so excited because there's going to be uh, all these artists living here and we're going to be meeting and uh, collaborating um, on different projects, uh, connecting. I think that's just like the best thing in the world. It was really you know, fascinating to think this is a whole community moving for something with an ideal. And the, the, the base of it is creativity. El Barrio's art space, PS109, will also be a secure home for organizations such as Taller Latino Americano that has been serving the Latino community and general public through the arts for over 30 years. Bernardo Palombo is its executive director and founder. We are moving our organization, El Taller Latinoamericano, right here, to continue from the place where most of our Latin culture started, uh, to keep on doing what we have been doing, and see if we can do what is the hope of this place, to create a cultural renaissance. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Thank you. Judith Escalona, Independent Sources. That's our show this week. Thanks for staying tuned. Till next time, be independent-minded.